Welcome everyone to our data science and computational statistics seminars. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce the speaker today, Dr. Franca Hoffman from University of Bonn. So Franca obtains her PhD uh, from Cambridge and Imperial College London in 2017. From 2017 to 2020, she was a postdoc at Caltech. And then since uh, uh, September 2020, she becomes uh, a born junior fellow at the Hausdorff Center for Mathematics at the uh, University of Bonn. So today, uh, Franca will tell us about Kahneman versus style gradient flows. So we will record uh, the talk. And if you have any question, uh, we encourage you to maybe just unmute yourself or to type in the chat box. And uh, Franca will uh, stay a little bit longer after the talk uh, for further discussions. So please welcome Franca. Thank you very much uh, for the introduction and thanks for inviting me um, to speak as part of your seminar series. So I heard that um, it is quite interdisciplinary. So I will, uh, yeah, so this is why I think the topic is quite fitting because it also sits at the intersection of several different fields and, and I hope that I will be able to explain things in such a way that it is accessible uh, to everyone. Okay, so today I will be talking about a work that uh, we published last year in Syme Journal on uh, Applied Dynamic Assistance with Alfredo Gabuno Inigo, um, who was a postdoc at uh, Caltech at that time, who's now faculty in, in Mexico, Andrew Stewart, who is a professor at Caltech, and, and Wu Chen Li, who was um, a postdoc at, at UCLA at the time. Um, so here, what, what is it that we're trying to do? So generally, we're interested in parameter calibration and uncertainty quantification. Um, and so here with parameter calibration, um, we're interested in the question of what is the most likely uh, set of parameters that could have given rise to the data that we observed. And when we're thinking about uncertainty quantification, we want to answer the, answer the question, um, given this parameter, how likely is it that this parameter gave rise to the data that we observed? And so we kind of try to understand the distribution of parameters in that, in that setting. And so concretely uh, to picture what, what this means, you can think for example of, um, complicated weather models, um, weather forecasts or climate models, where you have often a lot of um, coupled PDEs with boundary conditions and initial conditions and so on. And maybe there is some diffusion coefficient that we don't know, or there's some boundary condition that we don't know. And so this would be then one of our parameters that we're trying to infer from the data. Now, if we had this parameter, if we knew the diffusion coefficient, we could then uh, solve all these uh, coupled PDEs, of course not explicitly, but uh, computationally, and, and therefore get the solution. And then maybe we take some time averages of that solution. And that's how we compute the observables, which we can then compare to the data that, that we go out and, and measure. And so, of course, this data might be noisy and, and we want to take that into account and so on. So there's a number of algorithms that um, are well suited for addressing those uh, two problems, parameter calibration and uncertainty quantification. And I here want to focus on two different approaches. Uh, one, the ensemble common inversion me methods, which are ways of um, optimizing. So this, this gives you a way of, of doing parameter calibration. And then what we introduced is the ensemble common sampler, which is a new method for uh, sampling a given probability distribution, which in this setting will be the posterior distribution of the inverse problem connected to this um, uncertainty quantification uh, problem. And, and the reason why we propose this uh, sampling algorithm in this way is because of an underlying gradient flow structure. And this underlying gradient flow structure is um, not the a classical Wasserstein two gradient flow, but rather a, a generalization of that. 
which we call the Kalman Wasserstein gradient flow. And I will explain also in detail what that is. So this is just to give an idea what I'm planning to discuss uh, for this seminar. So before we get started on the inverse problem and sort of that, the setup there, uh, let me just give you some brief introduction of um, the kind of grading flow structure that we want to use here. Um, so this is just to give you some basic ideas about what I mean by gradient flow in case uh, you haven't worked in that area. So if we wanted to minimize some given functional, so let's say we have just some functional E on some Euclidean space, finite dimensional Euclidean space Rn. So if we want to minimize this, this functional or this function, then um, one very classical method is to do a steepest descent uh, approach. So basically we, send, we, we um, start somewhere in the space uh, and then we start our walker from that point and we always move in the direction of the steepest descent of the energy. And so then eventually we will end up at least in a local minimum. And then if E has nice properties like strict convexity, then we know it's the global minimum. And so this of course has been done since, since over hundred years. Um, but it's, it's interesting that you can also uh, tr transfer that principle to infinite dimensions. So if now I have an inner energy that is defined, for example, on the set of probability measures. So the set of probability measures is an infinite dimensional space, of course. And now we would like to minimize um, an energy E over that space. We can also do a similar approach. So we can set up this um, steepest descent scheme now on the space of probability measures. And then what we obtain is a PDE. Now, the reason why I put the gradient here in quotation marks is because we have to make sense of what the gradient means in this infinite dimensional setting. And that really depends on how we measure distances between points. Uh, since otherwise, if you know, your notion of metric induces your notion of, of gradient, since it's related to measuring what does it even mean to, to have a steepest descent in a certain given direction. And so here, um, we, I want to introduce to you the Wasserstein two distance. So in case you're not familiar with, with it, um, the Wasserstein distance is simply a metric uh, on probability densities. And I, I will here uh, give you two different formulations for this metric. Uh, so one is the optimal transport formulation, where you think of this metric as measuring sort of um, the minimal cost of transporting mass distributed according to mu onto mass distributed according to nu. And so here this gamma is the joint probability measure um, with, with marginals mu and nu. Now you can also think of the Wasserstein metric as, uh, as a dynamical in terms of the dynamical formulation. Um, so here, this is an inner product between two vectors, which is really just now the, the um, L2, I mean, the square um, of the norms. And um, so what this is doing, basically, it is minimizing the kinetic energy along the paths in probability space that links the point mu with the point nu. So now we, we think of this probability space as, as, a, as a space, as a landscape, and we have two points, mu and nu, and we create we create paths in between them. And so then we select those paths that, that have the minimal kinetic energy along the way. So this is also known as the benamou brené formulation. And the reason why I write it here in this way is because um, this lends itself very nicely to um, generalizations that we will use later on. So I will come back to this definition in a bit. Okay, but the reason why the Wasserstein metric is very useful for the setting is because we, we can describe what the gradient in the Wasserstein, Wasserstein metric is. Um, and so this has been an object of study for uh, several decades. And you can have a look at this book by Ambrosio Gigli and Savary if you want to uh, know more of the details. But in short, um, we now know that the gradient of some energy in the Wasserstein metric is given by minus the divergence of rho times the gradient of the first variation of E, where the first variation is, is defined in this way, as long as sort of rho is nice enough and this, this limit is well-defined. Okay, so, so the reason why this is quite exciting 
is because this allows us to write a large class of PDEs as infinite dimensional steepest descent schemes. Um, and, and in particular, any PDE that has this shape, so that looks like a continuity equation where the um, velocity field V here can be written as the gradient of the first variation of some energy, which we'll have to find, then we can think of this PDE as an infinite dimensional gradient descent. And that's very powerful because it means that th there's a lot of diffusive PDEs that fall into this, into this category. And this then lends itself, of course, very nicely to analysis because we can make use of the energy and its minimizes um, and convergence to it for analyzing uh, the PDE, which could be very complicated in general. Um, now here, this is the PDE that we will be dealing with in terms of the inverse problem that I will introduce in a minute. So I want to start by giving you the PDE so that you already know where we're heading with this or what the structure of the problem will look like later. So if you notice, this looks exactly like the Wasserstein II gradient flow that I just introduced. However, just with one difference, and that is that we have here a matrix in front of the gradient. And this matrix is the covariance matrix of this distribution of parameters rho. So here rho depends on theta. So theta is a vector in some, let's say, RK that um, uh, denotes the parameters of our problem. And so the theta bar here is the, the mean of, of that density. And so this uh, covariance matrix, of course, evolves in time and it depends non-linearly on the row itself. Um, so you can see how it, this makes the structure of the equation a bit more complicated. And so the idea now is that we want to choose an energy E in such a way that the unique attractor uh, of this PDE is exactly the posterior distribution for an underlying inverse problem that we want to solve. And, and also this will allow us to set up efficient derivative free algorithms for solving in those problems. So we I will explain later how this PDE appears in the problem setup of, of this algorithm, but just so that you already know where, where we're heading here. Okay, so next I would like to talk a bit more about the setup for the inverse problem itself. So here, this is uh, a very general framework for a large class of inverse problems where we have a map. So this is typically called the observation map that goes from the observation space, sorry, to, from the parameter space to the observation space. And um, so, so if, if we are thinking in the context of climate models, for example, what I described at the beginning, then your theta that you stick into this function would be your diffusion coefficient, your boundary co coefficient, whatever are the, the parameters that you don't know about your problem. But if you knew what these parameters are, you could then solve all these um, coupled PDEs and obtain some, let's say, average quantity of the solution, which is then your observable. So your operator G would denote doing all of that. So solving the PDE and then averaging the solution and so on. And, and then you can compare that with your actual data. So the Y here is the data, but you also assume that your data is only noisy observations. And so this is why we're adding some uh, noise eta here. Of course, this is also rather simple in the sense that, okay, we're assuming that the noise is Gaussian and, and that it's additive noise, but this is the general setup that we're working here. And this, um, function G can be very horrible. I mean, nonlinear, very difficult to compute, um, but it is able to, I mean, we're able to compute what is G of theta for any given theta, just that it might be costly uh, depending on the application. And in particular, we might not be able to differentiate G um, or we might be able to, but it's very expensive to do. So in other words, we would like to not make use of derivatives of G um, for the algorithm that we were deriving. Um, okay, so now if we wanted to do parameter calibration, we want to essentially find uh, the parameter theta star 
that is most likely given the data. And so this corresponds to minimizing this data misfit here, where the gamma comes from the noise term. And then as you often do, we also regularize with some quadratic, additional quadratic term here, um, which is, you know, this is a, a choice that we make. And, and this actually has a, a meaning in terms of the prior information, if you think of it in the Bayesian framework that I will come to in a, in a second. So here the phi sub R for regularized, right? Um, so this is basically an optimization problem that you would like to solve uh, to do parameter calibration. Now, okay, if you just wanted to minimize phi R, you would maybe just take the gradient and then put that to zero and try to solve. However, to do that, you would have to also compute the gradient of G. And as I mentioned, we don't want to do that. Um, so we would like to derive a derivative free algorithm for optimizing this, this phi R. And then the other problem that I mentioned is uh, uncertainty quantification. So for this, it, it, um, it is useful to think of this problem in the Bayesian setting. So now we're assuming that we know some prior distribution of the parameters. Uh, so here we just take a Gaussian prior distribution with some covariance matrix sigma zero. And then the, the uh, form of the model for the inverse problem that I presented gives us the likelihood. So it, given some parameter theta, we can then calculate what is g of theta. And then we know how the data minus g of theta is distributed because we, we assume that we know the distribution of the noise. And now just using Bayes' theorem, uh, we can write down what is the posterior distribution, just the likelihood times the prior. And so if I leave out the normalization constants, what I then get is exactly exponential of minus phi r where this phi r is the same function that I presented on the previous slide. So you see now that if we find the minimizer of this phi r, this corresponds exactly to finding the maximum point of the posterior distribution. Okay, so just to summarize, um, this is the posterior distribution, our quantity of interest. And then this is this uh, function phi r that depends on this g of theta which we can evaluate, potentially uh, it, it costs a lot to evaluate, but which we don't want to differentiate. And now we want to derive a method that allows us to generate approximate samples from this posterior distribution. And at the same time, we want to do that in such a way that it is derivative free and also that it allows us to perform mathematical analysis. And, and this will come from the underlying gradient flow structure that allows us to do that. Okay, so if there are any questions, feel free to sort of write in the chat or stop me in the middle and, and ask questions. Okay, so I, I want to start with the ensemble common inversion algorithm. So this is a whole family of methods that can be used for um, optimization tasks, as I mentioned at the beginning. And there is an underlying uh, particle evolution uh, that drives the algorithm. So here I'm just writing down the continuous time formulation of that particle uh, evolution, which of course then you would discretize in time to implement it. Um, so as I said, there's a few different variations of this, but I just picked here the key part of, of this particle evolution to explain what is happening here. Um, so you see that you have this inner product here where the G bar is the, the mean of G evaluated at the different particles. So we have a total of J particles um, and we start them at some initial conditions and then we evolve them according to this equation. And we hope that they will then evolve into being samples of the posterior distribution. So that's the idea. Um, so here, what this first part is doing, it is, driving particles to collapse. So it's driving particles towards the mean, to, to, to collapse to the same point. And then the second part here is driving particles to match the data. And you can also see that this theta bar here, which is the mean again, um, now the ensemble mean, I wouldn't actually have to put it here because if I do that and I sum over K, right? Then I'm only summing over this part here because this one depends on J. 
and um, then this term is zero. So essentially this factors out. The reason why I put the theta bar here, you will see in a minute. Um, okay, but, but another interesting thing to note is that this is a derivative free algorithm. So essentially here we are approximating gradients by differences. And so we're able to do this without having to compute the derivative of the function g. Um, and if you implement this, you will observe that very quickly, uh, the particles all collapse to a point. And, and that point is exactly the maximum of the posterior distribution. So if you want to do parameter calibration, then this is a useful tool. Um, however, if you want to do sampling, so if you want to sample from the posterior distribution, then this collapse happens a bit too quickly um, to really observe what the distribution of these uh, points or these ensemble members are. So you would like to prevent this collapse from happening in some sense. And there's many ways of how you could do this, of course. Um, so this is how we suggested then the ensemble common sampler, which is basically the same algorithm as for the ensemble common inversion methods. So I wrote EKI for denoting um, what I wrote on the previous slide. And now we're adding two more terms here. And I would like to just explain uh, what they are uh, before moving on. So um, this term here is a term that comes from the prior information. So the sigma zero was the covariance matrix of the prior. And it basically acts as a regularizer in the optimization problem. So you could also add this when you want to do optimization um, to the previous slide that I showed you. Um, the, the really important, oh, and this has actually been done already by Chada Stewart and Tom. But the, the, the part that I would like to focus on is this noise part. So what we're doing is we're adding some Brownian motion here, um, but then we um, have we, as a factor here, the square root of the covariance matrix where the C of theta is now the ensemble covariance. So just computed from the J particles at that time T. Um, and so we will see why this is an important choice um, because this is exactly the term that will give us a gradient flow structure when we look on the macroscopic uh, limits, I mean, on the mean, in the mean field limits. So if we look at the macroscopic PDE that lies behind this particle evolution, then this will ensure that we have a gradient flow structure. Um, for those of you who are familiar with inverse problems or with these uh, ensemble common methods, I should probably also mention that this is a slightly different approach than is usually taken in the sense that instead of um, perturbing with noise uh, the, the observations, the data, so usually you would have a second equation that evolves corresponding observations. We here only evolve the um, parameters, theta, these J parameters themselves, and then perturb them directly. Um, and what this is essentially doing as a particle evolution, so, so the, the inverse problem itself does not have a time to it, right? It's, it's a static problem. We just want to invert it once. Um, and we now artificially introduce time here to essentially evolve samples from the posterior distribution into samples of the posterior distribution. Um, so you may know that sampling from some given target distribution is a very difficult problem in general, if this target distribution is not Gaussian and looks more complicated in some way. And there's many algorithms that have tried to tackle that problem. So the idea here is that you want to sample from something difficult. And so instead, you sample from something easy, which is your prior, which you choose to be Gaussian. And then you evolve these samples according to this particle evolution that transforms those prior samples into the samples of the posterior distribution that you're interested in. OK, so that just as, as a general bigger picture. Um, OK, so now that we have the, the sort of particle model that underlies this ensemble common sampler, um, I want to show you in the next step how to make the connection between this particle evolution and the PDE that I showed you at the beginning, and, and especially how the gradient flow structure comes in there.
Ah, but before I do this, I have a little numerical toy example for you. I mean, this is just to illustrate really what is, uh, what is going on here. So this is um, an elliptic boundary value problem, uh, which is very simple. I mean, this is just, as I said, a toy model. Um, and here, so this is 1D, um, we have two parameters that we don't know. So we have one that is in the diffusion coefficient, and then we have another one, which is one of the boundary conditions. Um, and, and the nice thing about this equation is that we can solve it explicitly. So we can write down what the solution is in terms of theta. And now we can go and evaluate this solution at two given locations, x1 and x2. And we can also uh, take observations. Um, so we just put some no noise on the, on the true solution there. Um, and this would be then our forward map g of theta, right? And so this is how the uh, landscape of the corresponding phi looks like. So this is here just the data misfit that you see in the console plot. And if you run the ensemble common inversion algorithm with a thousand particles, then all these thousand particles very quickly collapse to um, this point here, which is exactly the maximum of the posterior distribution. Um, now, if I run the ensemble common sampler, instead, so these are the green dots, you see that they do not collapse. And in fact, they nicely distribute in those regions where most of the mass of the posterior is located. And this is also a thousand particles. And now we compare this with um, MCMC. So this is a Metropolis-Hastings algorithm. I think this is not, these orange particles are now 10 to the five. So it's a lot more, you need a lot more particles for this to work well. And you can compare and, and you can see that, um, yeah, they, they are covering roughly the same, the same region. So this is why often people, um, especially in engineering applications, would like to use these ensemble common methods um, because to be able to use NCMC, you often need so many particles that it would just be unpractical for the kind of problems that you tackle there. And, and so, Usually ensemble common methods already give you a reasonable answer or outputs even for a smaller number of particles. Um, okay, so now I want to make this connection <laughs> that I advertised um, before the numerical example, how to get from the particle evolution to the PDE. Um, so here I wrote out the particle evolution again, now in all its glory. So you recognize the first term that I showed you before and then these two additional terms. And, and the C of theta is the empirical covariance, as I said. So now to get from this particle evolution to the PDE, there's essentially two steps uh, that are involved. Uh, the first step is a simple approximation. And the second step is then to take the number of particles to infinity. So to basically take a mean field limit. So in the first step, we will now um, look at a linear approximation of this G minus the mean. Um, and so, you know, of course, <laughs> um, for this uh, to work, you would need that the G is differentiable, which we don't want to differentiate, but for a second, let us, let us allow to do that. Um, so then we get this matrix A there instead. And you can now see why I wrote this theta bar, because essentially, um, this whole term here becomes A times theta K minus theta bar. Um, and I can put the A on the other side. So then here I have A transpose and then I have theta K minus theta bar. And I can now exchange this theta K minus theta bar with the second component here. And, and then I, I basically get the covariance matrix out here as a, as a preconditioner. So um, that's what this buys you. So what you get, I mean, you can check this for yourself if you like. It's not it's like a line or something. But yeah, what you get then is, is um, here this uh, preconditioned gradient descent where the second, so this term here with the sigma zero is now also absorbed in this gradient term because we're also considering phi r, so the regularized um, version where you have the quadratic term with the sigma zero. Um, so now you have a preconditioned gradient descent with, with the noise term that depends also on the covariance matrix. Um, so if your forward map G is linear, 
then this is not an approximation, right? Then this is exact. Um, now, often in applications, obviously it's not linear. Um, however, what, what I showed you before is that this um, ensemble common sample, this particle evolution is making particles to go closer to each other if they're very spread. And so we expect the solution to be close to the solution of this um, particle model on the previous slide. Now, of course, this is a conjecture and actually this is one of the things that we're currently looking at to, to rigorously prove that. Um, in other words, how good is this approximation in the case where G is nonlinear? But um, if you just look at this equation, uh, you know, there, there has been um, work or it is known that putting a good preconditioner here accelerates your um, gradient descent. Uh, so this is the role that this covariance matrix here plays. Um, and then uh, the sorry, second, uh, uh, yeah? uh, sorry. Uh, uh, can you explain uh, how you compute? I because you, you 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 said that you don't want to compute the gradient of G. Can you explain that again? Um, yes. So we're the now assuming. I. Yes, we we we're now assuming that we can compute the gradient. I see. So so mm -hmm. if you can differentiate G, then you can do that, right? Um, explicitly. Mm -hmm. If you can't. Um, you can ask sort of what is the best linear approximation to G and then instead you now look at this model right and then mm -hmm. you ask how good is this approximation um, uh, I see you can even go a step further you can if, if you write you can write down this equation even with the G right instead of writing a of mm -hmm. theta I'm going to write G of theta here um, I where see. I can look at G of theta as being something that is not differentiable and or, well, then the, the gradient would make sense. Let's say um, it, you have to make sense of this equation in some sense, obviously, <laughs> but you can mm -hmm. still put the G of theta in its general form here, right? And you can then mm -hmm. ask how close are the trajectories of this system compared to the trajectories of this system? To G. I see. You know that they're the same if G is linear, but if G linear. is not mm -hmm. linear, then they're not the same. And the question is, you know, how close are they or how can you bound maybe the difference of the solutions depending on um, how close G is to a linear function? I see. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. I mean, please feel free to stop me and ask. If... Um, okay, so that's the first uh, approximation. And then the second approximation is to take a mean field limit. Um, and this has actually been shown by uh, Ding and Lee um, in a paper that was also published uh, earlier this year. And so this is uh, Chin Lee in um, University of Wisconsin-Madison. It's not Wu Chen Lee, who's a co-author on this paper I'm presenting here. Um, so essentially now you take the number of particles to infinity. And so then this empirical covariance converges to the covariance of this distribution we draw. And in the in the particle limits, in the mean field limits, the particle evolution equation for sort of an average particle is exactly the same equation, but now you have here the, the covariance of rho instead of the empirical covariance. And then you can write down the corresponding Fokker Planck equation. And so here the, the divide, divergences and gradients there are in theta, of course, but the um, covariance matrix does not depend on theta because we integrate over the parameters, right? So you can move this into the derivative and write it in this very nice form. And now you should see the connection to the PDE that I showed you at the beginning, because this is exactly the sort of generalized gradient flow structure um, that I mentioned, where we now choose a very specific energy here, such that the first variation of this energy is exactly phi r, which is our potential, plus log rho. And so what we would like to understand now is what are the stationary states of this PDE? And can we say anything about the convergence to these stationary states? And so the, the first thing that you notice is that, in fact, there are many stationary states. There's a whole manifold of stationary states. And that is because every time that the covariance matrix is zero, you stop moving, right? I mean, then you, that's a stationary state. 
And the covariance matrix is zero if and only if rho is a Dirac. So basically all the Dirac's are stationary states. But then in addition, you have one more stationary state, which is the one that makes this um, gradient here zero. And that is exactly the posterior distribution that we are after. So essentially what you would like to show is that if you start somewhere that is not a direct distribution, then you converge towards the posterior without hitting any of the other stationary states. So the, any other directs. Um, okay. Sorry. So think, yeah. uh, they, they are not on the equilibrium, right? Because uh, you, you may have something that, the right hand side equal to zero, but uh, each of them is different from zero, right? So there may be more, even more. Uh, Sorry? You may have even more uh, uh, stationary states, right? Because uh, you only need the right hand side uh, equal to uh, To be constant zero. instead of zero, you mean? Yeah, 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 yeah. I yeah. think that can be ruled out thanks to the gradient flow structure. I mean, in general, mm -hmm. that is true. But then you can, there, there's some additional arguments um, to see that um, the constant in here has to be in fact zero. I um, see, I see. So that's from the gradient flow structure and the conservation of mass, I think. Okay, mm -hmm. so you, you somehow already need the gradient flow structure here. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, let me, uh, mention a few things on the gradient flow structure then. Um, so I will work here on a nicer set than the probability measures. Um, so I will assume that my densities are strictly positive, um, always every, almost everywhere, and that they see infinity. So this is really very nice, right? And, and then you can ask, okay, how do you generalize this to the full set of probability densities? But just so that everything that I write down is, is well defined for now. Um, and now this is a, a new metric, um, which we call the Kalman Wasserstein metric. And this looks exactly like the dynamical formulation of the Wasserstein two distance that I introduced at the beginning, just now that we put here, this covariance matrix as a weight of the inner product. And, and then it also appears here in the equation for the geodesics. And the important, so, so the way how you can interpret this is to say that, well, we're still looking for the paths between mu and nu that have minimal kinetic energy, but now the way how you measure the kinetic energy is not the L2 um, product, uh, the L2 norm, but it is this sort of weighted in a product. And the weight itself is changing along this path because it depends on T, right? Because the covariance matrix depends on rho of T. And you can then show that if you use this weighted metric or generalized Wasserstein metric, then um, if you want to know what is the gradient flow for some given energy E in that metric, you get exactly the kind of structure that I showed you at the beginning. And so then, of course, there's a bigger picture behind this to ask, okay, what, what are the properties of this kind of metric space now? Um, yeah, just so that you can see the general picture. I was looking at the time. Okay, maybe I should skip this a bit. Um, but yeah, you can, I mean, the energy here in our context that we want is the one that has first variation phi r plus log rho, as I said plus a constant, right? Because it's always defined up to a constant only anyhow. And so that gives us exactly the kubak leibler divergence now, plus some constant. And then the unique solution of the corresponding Euler-Lagrange condition is exactly our posterior distribution. And then you can compute um, the time derivative along paths of this energy. And then you get exactly minus the Fisher information where now the Fisher information is also weighted then a product is also weighted with this uh, covariance matrix. And, and even just from this, you can see that the energy always decays along paths until either the covariance is zero, because then this fish information is zero, or your, your rho is equal to the posterior distribution. Um, okay, 
So I see that I'm running out of time. So let me just say a few words on, on um, convergence to equilibrium. So there is a very simple estimate that you can do. Uh, so this is quite crude. So this is just to get an idea. So let's say that our the Hessian of our phi r is uniformly bounded from below. Um, so it's strictly convex, essentially, with some lambda. And this is the classical assumption for Fokker-Planck equations, right? We want to show uh, decay to equilibrium with a certain rate. And now, in addition, we also assume that the covariance matrix is bounded below uniformly in, in time. So this is a rather strong assumption, of course. But if we make this very strong assumption, then we can show convergence to equilibrium in L1 norm, I mean, also in energy. Um, and what is interesting is that, so, so this is a classical result from bakri emery If you just look at the classical Fokker-Planck equation, and then your rate would simply be lambda, which is the um, lower bound on the Hessian. And now we obtain the rate alpha lambda. So you see in which way the covariance matrix acts as, a, as, a, as an acceleration in the convergence to equilibrium. Um, so I will skip the proof. Um, and, and now if we are in the case of a linear forward map, then we can say a lot more. Um, so first of all, the um, moments of this PDE are closed equations for the mean and the covariance matrix. So, and you can actually solve them explicitly. Um, which also then means that you understand fully the Gaussian picture. So if you start as a Gaussian, you remain Gaussian, and you can exactly write down how the mean and the covariance evolve. Um, and you can then, of course, also show that Gaussians converge exponentially fast to raw infinity. Um, yes, so this then all follows. Um, we also obtain convergence for non-Gaussian initial conditions, um, simply because this uh, phi r, the Hessian is bounded from below and is independent of theta. So this comes from the assumption that G is linear. Um, and then uh, we can show that the covariance matrix is bounded below as an operator uniformly in time. There's a little argument to be made, but that's not too difficult. And then we can apply the previous theorem. Um, but of course, the interesting question is, can, what can we say about the case of nonlinear G? Um, and that's, that's still an open problem. Uh, now there is a recent uh, follow-up work by Jose Carrillo and, and Urban Weiss, which also just got published, um, looking at exactly the linear case and uh, proving these convergence results in, in a lot more detail than what we did in this initial work. Um, and, as, and in particular, they wrote down the explicit solution for the covariance matrix um, in, in that case. Um, and then also showed convergence in Wasserstein distance. I mean, the fact is that if you in the linear forward map case, then, and you can show uniform bounds from below on the covariance matrix, then you can just use the Wasserstein distance instead of this more general weighted Wasserstein distance, because you can just bound the covariance matrix and pull it out of all the expressions that, that you're dealing with. Um, so this looks a bit complicated as a rates, but um, in our case, we have the sigma here to be equal to one, which is like a tuning parameter for the noise part. And so if you put sigma equal to one, then this is just e to the minus t up here. So in other words, um, your rate of convergence is then just one, which is very interesting because it means that it does not depend on the choice of potential. And, and, and that's sort of one of the interesting insights here, if you want to understand what's actually happening, um, is that if you use this covariance matrix as a pre conditioner, in this case, you can show that this covariance matrix converges to the inverse of the Hessian of the potential, which means that in the limit, um, they, they, the, the precondition sort of cancels out the effect of the potential on the convergence. I mean, this is just an asymptotic rate of convergence anyways, right? Um, okay, so there's some interesting things here to understand for sure. Um, okay, so let me come to a conclusion then. Um, and then we have some time for questions also. Um, so in, in summary, what I, what I presented to you here is a new algorithm 
for generating approximate samples from a given posterior distribution, which then allows us to solve inverse problems and um, in particular do uncertainty quantification for those inverse problems. And the way how we suggested this algorithm, especially the covariance dependent noise structure is based on this underlying gradient flow structure um, for which we introduced this common Wasserstein space. And what I should also say is that this work has given rise to a new algorithmic framework called Calibrate Emulates Sample. Um, so there's another follow on a publication here from a team of people at, at Caltech. So these uh, work in the climate analysis group at Caltech. And so they were interested in this for, um, for the purpose of climate simulations. And um, what they, so, so you still, the issue is that to be in the regime where you're close to the mean field limits, you would want to take a lot of particles. Um, but then if you use a lot of particles, you need to evaluate this forward map G many, many times, which you don't want to do because that's expensive, especially in these kind of settings. So the idea of the calibrate emulate sample is that you run the ensemble common sampler with a very small number of particles. And then um, you get sort of approximate samples of your posterior and you use these um, to then construct a Gaussian process emulator. So you basically construct a surrogate model for your forward map G using those samples. So that's the emulate step. And now that you have um, a surrogate model for your forward map G that you can sample one from cheaply, you can sample many times. And so of course you can generalize this idea also to other ways of calibrating, emulating and sampling. But this is, this is the problem where this idea came from, essentially. I can talk more about this if, if you're interested. Um, and then there's a couple of other um, follow-up work that I didn't have time to include in the talk, but I'm also happy to comment more on this um, if there's time during the questions. So this is the paper for the mean fit limit that I mentioned. Uh, I also mentioned the follow-up work by Jose Carrillo and Urban Weiss. There's a note by um, Nicolas Nisken and Sebastian Reich who noticed that um, if you write down the Hocker-Planck equation for the finite particle a system. So if you write down the empirical density for a finite number of particles and the Fokker-Planck equation that it satisfies, there's actually an additional term there. And this is it's a divergence of the covariance. And this additional term disappears in the limit as the number of particles goes to infinity. But what that means is that you need a correction term in order to um, maintain the, the gradient flow structure also for the finite particle setting which is the setting that you work in, of course, if you um, implement this as an algorithm. So this is a very important observation. Um, and then they also suggested uh, as, uh, for, as a follow-up work, another algorithm, which is trying to overcome that. Um, okay, so <laughs> there's many open questions still, and I think um, still a lot of work to do. So for people more interested in applications, of course, um, it's interesting to stress test those algorithms on different engineering problems, also see in which um, situations it is advantages or less good than other methods that are out there. Um, then there's this question that I mentioned already earlier, how close are the dynamics of the ensemble common sampler to the common Wasserstein gradient flow if you have nonlinear G? So that's something we're looking into. And then something we're also working on um, now with a group of people is sort of understanding the properties of this common Wasserstein space uh, more generally. Uh, so how do the geodesics behave? What are the corresponding function inequalities and so on? And finally, there's a question of, you know, why the covariance matrix? I mean, if you think of just in general, this, um, metric space, right, uh, where you're weighting with the covariance matrix, you could also weight with some other matrix. Um, and maybe there is a choice that is even better than the covariance matrix in terms of 
your rate of convergence. I mean, the reason why we ended up with the covariance is simply because it comes from this uh, derivative free algorithm where you approximate gradients with differences. But um, if you remove yourself from that specific inverse problem setting, then you can ask this more general question, right? To choose some other matrix there. Um, and here I have some references um, to the papers that I mentioned. Okay, so I think I will stop here so that there's still time for questions. Thank you very much, Franka. It's perfect timing. So yeah, are there any questions from uh, the audience, please? Um, hi, Franka. Uh, can I ask, ask a couple of questions? Sure. Um, that's a very nice talk, by the way. Um, so if you go back to the preconditioning Langevin equation. Uh, yep. Yeah, I believe you have a slides um, there. So my question was, um, in which settings can we use this preconditioning strategies? Um, can we use this kind of strategy in some general um, Langevin equations or is there some restrictions on that? Mm, yes. I mean, you need, to use, you need to choose a preconditioner in such a way that it actually helps the evolution. Um, there's, there's this paper by Matthews, Lime, Kula, and Wehrer from 2018, which I can recommend for this, um, where they look exactly at, yeah, those accelerating properties, if you put a preconditioner there. Okay, so it sounds like we have to kind of choose a good preconditioner so that it can actually accelerate the sampling or something similar. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. I mean, I think here, this is related to how does the preconditioner relate to the Hessian of the potential of the phi r. But there's a, a group of people that is looking exactly at those questions. I mean, I'm, you know, I've also just read up this literature in this context to understand exactly this point. Um, but the, yeah, that is, that is sort of a whole, Field by itself also. Thank you very much. Welcome. Thank you. Other question, please. Yeah. Hi, Frank. Uh, first, thanks for the very interesting talk. And also, I have a couple of questions. Uh, I guess my first question is, um, um, so you, you sort of mentioned that in, actually in your problem, you can, um, you can deal with like a nonlinear uh, forward model G. So my, I'm just curious, like, uh, uh, so how about this um, kind of the error model? What if your the noise or the observation error is not Gaussian? Can you match your ah, problem? Um, then this approach would not work because the fact that you assume Gaussian noise Mm -hmm. allows you to include the data misfit in this very specific way. So the, the assumption on the Gaussian noise basically sits here, right? Mm -hmm. um, with the one over gamma squared. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the honest answer is we haven't looked into how to generalize this to settings where the noise is not Gaussian. But I think that's also a very important question because even though in a lot of settings you can allow yourself to assume Gaussianity with under not not by not breaking too many things but there's also settings where you know that your noise is not Gaussian and yeah. then you shouldn't be using this approach really um, but yeah it's not something we have looked at Okay, thanks. And uh, yeah, another question is, uh, it's, uh, it looks like, uh, especially like the kind of the Vasistian part, it looks like it's a, kind of a, a transformation based uh, uh, sampling method. So uh, in that case, I'm just curious how it compares with other kind of transformation based, how the performance compared to other transformation based methods, such as like, for example, like a, a standard variation, or if you are you know, aware of that, yeah. Ah, yeah, I am. I, I, that's a question that I also have. <laughs> How, yeah, I was following the, the work on the stain variational gradient descent and yeah. um, they're different. Um, and I'm wondering if there is a more general framework that allows to incorporate both of them. I mean, in terms of the structure of the space, like can you 
derive an even more general sort of set of distances that a specific cases has. You know, that's a question that I was asking myself, but I don't have an answer to that, unfortunately, yeah. at the moment. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Just one last, uh, just one, one quick question. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, regarding your last, I mean, you haven't, you didn't actually discuss it. It's just a kind of about the emulator part. Um, so you mentioned that you use Gaussian process as an emulator. So I'm just curious how, you know, how, how, like how high dimension you can handle using the kind of the Gaussian process. Ah, I had some additional slides that I didn't. Um, wait, let me. If I stop to share, I can maybe <laughs> quickly compile those. Um, yeah. So. In, in the climate um, setting, they are dealing with dimensions up to 100, roughly. Yeah, 100 is quite, uh, in some sense, I, my understanding is that 100 is a little bit high for, you know, the standard GP, or you probably mm -hmm. have some special treatment for that, or? So I'm not an expert at all on Gaussian processes, but I just know what they told me about their work or what I know from what they have tried, right? Um, so it seems that for 100 dimensions, they can make it work. Um, now, there's also some people who contacted me that wanted to use this in like a machine learning context. Mm -hmm. As soon as you are trying to gradient descend on some weights that you're trying to learn, you easily in a dimension 1,000 or, or more, right? The, mm -hmm. the problem is that at each step, you will have to take the square root of the empirical covariance matrix in your algorithm. And that is expensive. I mean, that's kind of the numerical bottleneck for this. Um, and you also, because it changes in time, you will have to save it at every iteration. Um, and this is why this follow-up paper, okay, I'm gonna share this again and not compile the pages, maybe that's easier. Um, <laughs> I think I can explain it just in words. Um, so this follow-up paper here. Uh -huh. um, so Alfredo is also on it, who was an author on our paper. Um, they suggest an alternative way for um, putting covariance information into the noise term without having to recompute the square root of the covariance matrix at every iteration. And that actually makes it a lot more efficient. Okay. Um, which yeah. then I presume also means that you would be able to go to higher dimensions. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. yeah thanks. You're welcome. Uh, very interesting. Uh, uh, I'm a more theoretical uh, uh, perspective, uh, but I know that to accelerate the rate to equilibrium, somehow you can introduce uh, the non reversible dynamic. And, and uh, can you do that here? Maybe for instance, uh, instead of the overdam uh, Langzevin, um, maybe uh, you can study the underdam Langzevin dynamic. Oh, I see. Then of course, uh, in, in, in the limiting, uh, you do not expect um, vessel style gradient flow, uh, but uh, some sort you need to, you, you will have uh, a dynamic that contain both uh, conservative and, and dissipative part. And, and So if you don't care about having a gradient flow structure, mm -hmm. then there's a couple of things that you could do. And, and mm -hmm. I think that that is, certainly one of them. It's not something that I've personally looked into either, but we are now working on um, a similar but different <laughs> a sampler, mm -hmm. uh, which came out of this work, but it's um, dropping the condition that we want a gradient flow structure mm -hmm. um, and sort of trying to have a general family that allows to do both optimization and sampling for a family of parameters where we can then ask the question, how does the rate of convergence depend on the choices of the parameters of the algorithm? And um, uh, some of the known sampling and optimization algorithms would be, sub, would be spe special cases of this. So this is something that we're currently doing with um, also Jose Carrillo and mm -hmm. Andrew Stewart and Jules Bernay. So we put those people together and yeah, that yeah. Uh, should hopefully be out very soon.
But yeah, I, yeah just to, I mean, to answer your question, I think there's a couple of things that you could do. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. the question is, how do you compare? Like, what is better? How, mm -hmm. how do you? And yeah. I mean, one good question, of course, in that respect is the rate of convergence. The problem is that most of these sampling algorithms, um, you can say things for the linear forward map case, like mm -hmm. what we did here, but then to prove anything about the rate of convergence for nonlinear forward maps is really difficult. And that's the setting where you want to use it mostly. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's, I mean, I found it amazing when I started working on this to see that in engineering, really, there's a lot of people that use these ensemble common methods, of course, in settings where nothing is proven to work, right? And, and the empirical evidence shows that it does work very well in a lot of settings, but there's no theory to underpin this. I see. Um, yeah. And uh, also the, about the vaster style gradient flow structures for this, uh, I think uh, uh, Savarez and two other people have uh, a paper and they introduced uh, the very similar to this, the vaster style gradient flow structure, right? And, and uh, what is the difference between uh, this specific Kahneman and, and uh, you know that papers? Uh? Yes, I mean, I think I know which one you're talking about. There's a couple of, actually, there's a couple of papers. The, the, the fact that, uh, I mean, uh, the, 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 I mean, you, you introduced the C is that to have a nonlinear uh, deficit, right? And, and I think in, in, in the literature there, that uh, several, uh, discussion about that already and, and in particular one paper by Savre, I don't know the other two paper, uh, the other two authors. Azare but... and uh, Dolbo, I mean that's one of them, there, there, there are several but the, so there are some papers where people put a matrix there, so, I mean if yes. I go back to the, um, but typically a matrix that does not depend on time. So a matrix that either is just a fixed matrix that is constant mm -hmm. or maybe even depending on space in some cases. Mm -hmm. But what makes it difficult here is that it depends on time. I mean, that ah. it depends on rho of t, even in a nonlinear way, right? Mm -hmm. uh, through Because the covariance matrix also has the mean in it, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, I see. Mm -hmm. So that definitely does not exist. I mean, as far as I know, mm -hmm. it has not been introduced anywhere. Then there is another paper, and I think Savary and Jean Loibo are also on it, looking at nonlinear mobilities. Yes, yes. So basically, if you put here a function mm -hmm. um, that depends of rho on t, and now you ask, what properties do I need to assume on this function for this to be like a well-defined metric space and has nice properties and so on? Mm -hmm. um, so there's some work on this. Now, a lot of this goes out of the window if you move from scalar to matrix. Mm -hmm. Ah, ah, I see. Okay, properly they introduce uh, because yeah, they they just simply uh, the um, diffusion matrix is simply the product of rho and c, and properly that is a scalar. Ah, I see. Yeah, so c e here e uh, 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 tensor. Ah, I see. Yeah. I see. Okay. So okay. Mm -hmm. This is this is exactly what we're working on at the moment to understand what are those properties. Yeah. There's also Lizini who has a paper on this, I think. I see. I see. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay. Mm, interesting. Hopefully, yeah. also soon we might have some more information on this out. Yeah. 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 I'm also working on on on, on theoretically uh, on on vast style gradient flow, but uh, I mentioned I often interpreted in system with uh, conservative uh, effects as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so are there any questions, further discussion? Yeah, so uh, uh, great. And uh, we already did over time and uh, thank you uh, very much. And uh, we will see you uh, in our next seminar.